Wave to everyone. Hi. This is my daughter. She, uh, she's a big video gamer. She really wanted to come out and be on the stage at PAX. Can we please give her a big round of applause? All right, you're going to go. You're going to go right that way. Thank you. You just made her day. Hello. Good morning. How are you all? Are you excited to have a good PAX? Good. Well, I hope we'll, hope we'll get you off to a good start today. Um, I suffer terribly from something called imposter syndrome. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's basically this ever-present voice inside your head that tells you you don't really belong among your peers. That whatever success you've had has been based purely on luck. You haven't really earned it. You've only tricked people into believing you have any talent. And you're constantly on the verge of being exposed as a fraud. So as I stand here on this stage in front of all of you in this beautiful historic theater, that feeling is kicking in really hard right now. But why would I be nervous? This is not my first time speaking at PAX. I gave a talk here a few years ago, and it was a huge hit. I love Jeff Gersman in the front row there. He's like, what the fuck, dude? You said this was going to be cool. <laughs> I'm glad we have a few more people here today. I want to thank Jerry and Mike and Ryan Hartman at Penny Arcade for inviting me to do this. It's truly, and I mean, mean this very sincerely, a great honor and a privilege for me to be up here. And I'm also acutely aware of how lucky I am to be up here. And I'll give you some examples of that today. But Penny Arcade and I go way back. I've been an avid reader of the comics from the beginning. Mike and Jerry have always cracked me up. But I actually got to know them a few years ago after they started creating stuff outside of the regular Gabe and Tycho comics that they do every week. Things like Automata. All right? And my personal favorite, Lookouts. And I reached out to them because I thought some of this stuff might actually make really cool movies. And we talked about it, and we hit it off. And ever since then, I've kind of been Penny Arcade's unofficial ambassador in Hollywood, trying to help them get some of their stuff set up on the screen. And there's actually some, I can't talk about it, there's actually some fun stuff happening in that area right now. So stay tuned. And Mike and Jerry are just great guys. They've been very nice to me over the years. They even put me in one of their comics. I'll give you a moment to read this one. Sorry about the spoiler, the movie spoiler. And the best part about being in their comics is I didn't even have to give any money to charity to get in there. It's like a double win for me. <laughs> I've guest written some of their comics, like this short run I did on Automata called Blood and Oil. And Mike and I have even worked on a book together although we've struggled to get it published. Maybe because it's a potty training book based on Vulcan philosophy. <laughs> one day, one day we're going to get that book published. Right? Who wouldn't buy that? But most of all, I love PAX. It's my favorite convention maybe one of my favorite places in the world to come. In fact, my wife and I love PAX so much, we dragged our daughter here barely eight weeks after she was born. And she wasn't even fully immunized. <laughs> and this is a place where the giant beanbag areas are like petri dishes for contagious diseases. D do they still have those here? It's like a goddamn leper colony. That's her with the legendary Jeff Green. Here she is two weeks ago, the day she started second grade. I just threw that in there because she's awesome. But I love PAX because it's so authentic. Even as it's grown, and it obviously really has grown massively over the years, it has never lost its soul. It remains the most authentic place to come 
and share our mutual love of games. It's not just about the big show floor, which honestly is too noisy and crowded for someone my age who tries to avoid other people as much as possible. It's that in every corner and on every flat surface, someone is laying out cards or rolling dice. It's like the whole convention center becomes infested with gamers who crawl into every possible nook and crevice and build a nest there. PAX is a pure celebration of everything there is to love about games. And there is a lot to love, a lot to celebrate. People often dismiss games as silly, as a distraction, as somehow less than other forms of entertainment. But we, of course, know better. We know that games are important. We know that games are works of art. We know that games are fundamental to human nature. We know that games both build character and reveal character. We know that games can teach us who we are if we just listen to them. It's why human beings have been finding ways to devise and play games for as long as we've existed. It's what separates us from the lesser animals, like apes, rodents, and kind of funny's Greg Miller. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Greg. Fuck you. <laughs> but enough about the fundamental importance of games to human nature. Let's talk about me. That's right. When Pax first asked me to give this keynote, I asked them what it should be about. And they said I should just tell my story, how I started out, and what led me to be here today, the whole thing. So I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to tell you my life story. And I know what you're thinking. His whole life story? How fucking old is this guy? Mike and Jerry are supposed to be on in an hour. Well, I'm 47, but the good news is if you cut out all the boring bits of my life, what you have left over is good for about 30 minutes. So this should work out great. I was born in London in 1972, the same year Pong was invented. Oh, I just noticed that. That's fucking fantastic. Nice. Oh my god, that's brilliant. That might be the biggest laugh I get all day, and it wasn't even intentional. Here's me with my parents. My mum was a fitness instructor, and she also kept the house running. My dad also worked two jobs. He drove a newspaper truck by day and a taxi cab by night, and together they taught me the value of hard work. Here's me a bit older, a bit older, episode two, Attack of the Hormones. <laughs> I had some pretty gnarly acne back then. And researching this speech was really interesting because I dug out some of my old school reports. And <laughs> particularly for those who know me, it's amazing to see how much I haven't changed at all. There is room for improvement, primarily by Gary learning when to say nothing. He must learn the art of listening, underlined, to other people. Gary will have to learn to curb his tongue. Gary's drama work is excellent, but he needs to be more aware of other children's need to have a share of attention. <laughs> he must learn to be a good listener, as well as a lively talker. I am concerned that Gary only superficially listens to other people's points of view. Come on, Gary, be aware of other people's styles and attitudes. Gary is bright with ideas and drama. However, too often, without remembering, there are others in the group who might wish to have their say. So yeah, not a lot of personal growth over the last 30 years. But just one final note on that. This one's from my old English teacher. I would very much like to see Gary fulfill his considerable potential, but it's in his hands. So I just want to say to all of my old teachers, Speaking of fulfilling potential and things being in my hands, I really was listening, and it worked out pretty good in the end. So to all my teachers who put up with me, thank you. But the truth is, I mostly hated school, partly because, as you've just seen, I already thought I knew everything. I was a real smart aleck. And also because I was a terribly awkward, skinny nerd. Obviously, I've come a long way since then. Now I'm a terribly awkward, fat nerd. And in school, I got bullied a lot for being a nerd. And so to escape from reality, I disappeared into other ones, the worlds of science fiction and video games, where I could dream of other worlds, and I could be anyone I wanted to be. And I loved computers, and I loved games. 
I was this kid, only without the girl. And I was this kid, only without the girl. The last Starfighter actually had a huge influence on me as a kid. I loved the idea that by playing games, you could become a hero. And in fact, I spent days, back when I was, I think I must have been about 12, scouring every arcade in London, trying to find that Starfighter game so I could play it. Because it says at the very end of the credits, Starfighter game furnished by Atari. And I thought that meant it was real. I didn't realize it just meant they'd made like a prop cabinet for the movie. What a fucking idiot. <laughs> so back then, I was a skinny, spotty teenager with no social skills, but I had a really vibrant inner life, very active imagination. I was a constant daydreamer. And I fed that imagination with movies and computer games. Now, I'm going to ask you to call these next slides out if you recognize them. They get harder as they go. It starts very easy. I was into stuff like this. I didn't hear anyone say it. Do you actually know it? Star Wars. Thank you. And I was into stuff like this. It's my favorite scene in the movie. And this. Who knows this one? Time Bandits. Anyone? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This one might be easy. I think, that, I think the name's in the title, so it's a bit of a gimme. Elite. Elite, one of the greatest games ever made. And this, anyone know this one? Whizball, thank you, in the back. And this, anyone know this one? The Hobbit on the Spectrum. Now, as a kid, I grew up in the UK, and so I took a different gaming path than many of you in the US. We had Nintendo and Sega, but they weren't really big like they are, or they were here in America. I did start out with the classic. But from then on, for me, it was all about home computers. I had a VIC-20. I found this adult Bill Shatner pimping the VIC-20 back in the day. I love that. The Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And this one needs no introduction, my all-time favorite. And the games I played were really critical on starting me on the path to becoming a writer. A huge influence on me back then was Infocom. <laughs> Text adventures, or as they called them, interactive fiction that told amazingly rich stories. And they so inspired me that they led me to writing my very first fan fiction. I wrote short stories based on games like Suspended and A Mind Forever Voyage, and I would give them to my English teacher at school, and she would read them out to the class which would then lead to me getting picked on for being a teacher's pet. But I wasn't trying to impress anyone. I really just loved to write. Based on my obsession with the George A. Romero Living Dead movies, I even wrote my own 13-part zombie comic book epic. <laughs> yeah, the teachers actually caught my parents in over that one. <laughs> Back then, of course, most video games didn't have much in the way of story. So I would make up the missing story myself. I was obsessed with a Commodore 64 game called Paradroid that came out in 1985. And it had almost no story. You had to clear out a spaceship of rogue robots. And that was it. But I got so into the game, I came up with a whole backstory for it of my own. And that led to me writing my first ever screenplay, which was kind of like Die Hard on a spaceship with robots. And it was awful. But I loved teaching myself to write, and I learned a lot from it. So I was around 15, and I couldn't wait to get out of school. I hated it. I had no interest in going to college. And I knew I wanted to write or create, but I didn't know what. I love the idea of writing screenplays, but Hollywood seemed like a universal way. I thought about making games, but I had no idea how to program. But the other thing I loved was game magazines. Back when we had magazines with awesome covers like this. <laughs> in particular, I loved a magazine called Zap64. Thank you. One guy gets it. I read it cover to cover, and the game reviewers were my heroes. So I thought, maybe I could do that. I could be a games reviewer. So I typed out some mock game reviews on my sad little typewriter at home, and I mailed them into various magazines. And I got an interview at a magazine called Commodore User, which I also read. And I said earlier that luck had played a big part in bringing me here today. Well, here's the first example. In the late 1980s, when computers were evolving from 8-bit to 16-bit, the two big rival 16-bit computers were the Atari ST and the Commodore Amiga. And I really wanted one of them. 
and I was saving up all my money that I earned from doing a paper route. And the Atari ST was just a little bit cheaper than the Amiga 500. And I almost caved and got the ST as soon as I could have afforded it. But I knew that deep down I really wanted that Amiga. So I saved a little bit more and waited a little bit longer, and I got the Amiga 500 shortly after it came out. Look at that thing. Still one of the most beautiful computers ever made. And when I had the interview at Commodore User, the editor didn't seem that interested in me until he learned I'd just bought an Amiga. And suddenly he was very excited because the Amiga was still brand new in the UK. And they just didn't have enough freelancers who had one at home to review all the games that were coming in. So they sent me home with a big pile of games to review. And I was so excited, I couldn't wait to get home. I still remember calling my mum from the payphone at the bus station saying, Mum, Mum, I'm a games reviewer. I was so excited. And if I'd have bought that Atari ST instead, maybe I'm not standing here today. Here's one of my very first game reviews. This was in 1988, Buggy Boy for the Amiga. Qu quick show of hands, how many of you weren't even born in 1988? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Greg, can you stop looking at your fucking phone? <laughs> but aside from it getting me my first job in games, I loved this 16-bit era. Because it coincided with games really starting to tell stories for the first time. Who remembers these guys? I loved Cinemaware. They were the first interactive movies, and they really did combine fun gameplay with compelling movie-style narratives. Games like Defender of the Crown and Rocket Ranger, and it came from the desert. I just couldn't get enough of them. And speaking of Hollywood, the whole time, this whole time I was still tinkering around with writing screenplays as a hobby. And there's a movie that came out also in 1988 that blew my mind. Now, we all know it's a great movie, but one of the reasons why that is, is it's an absolute masterclass in screenwriting. First movie I ever saw that really got me thinking about how story works and why really good movies work the way they do. And I wanted to understand what it was about Die Hard that kept me on the edge of my seat. So I would take the VHS tape and reset the little timer on the machine, and I would make notes as I watched the movie. 15 minutes, the terrorists arrive. 30 minutes, John kills his first terrorist, stuff like that. And I was trying to kind of reverse engineer the movie, kind of like taking apart a clock to see how it works. So that remained a hobby that I kept on the back burner while I continued my career in games. I helped launch a magazine called The One for 16-bit games. There's my scrawny little 16-year-old face. And over the next several years, I worked on a bunch of different magazines. Here's my skinny little ass at a computer show while I was working on computer and video games magazines sometime in the early 90s. I just want to take a moment to thank someone without whom I wouldn't have a career in games. His name is Gary Penn. And he was one of the main editors at Zap64 when I read it as a kid. And I loved everything he wrote. I, I, I wanted to be just like him. And years later, when I sent my reviews into Commodore User, he was working there. And he was actually the guy that asked me to come in for an interview. So I was super nervous, because it wasn't just my first interview in games. I was also meeting one of my heroes for the first time. And he talked the editor into giving me a chance. And when he started his own magazine, he gave me a job on that too. Here's the whole team circa 1989. And we're still friends today. And I've, I've thanked him privately, but never publicly, not just for giving me my start, but also teaching me so much about writing and about games and about the importance of creative integrity. All things that still guide me today. So I was going to say to Gary, thank you. In 1993, I got to edit my own magazine with the launch of PC Gamer. There's the first ever issue. I was actually the youngest editor of a major national magazine in the UK at that time. I was 21. I edited PC Gamer for about two years, and it was very successful. So much so that around that time, a couple of years later, the publisher launched an American edition, and they asked me if I would come out to San Francisco and run it. And that's what brought me here to America in 1996. And my PC Gamer years are some of my fondest memories. The come here the photos from my editor's column haven't aged so well. But we got to do really cool stuff like this. This is one of my favorite things we ever did. It's kind of like our Vanity Fair Hollywood issue, but actually far more difficult because our celebrities, frankly, aren't as good looking. I don't know, Tim Schafer's got kind of a Mark Ruffalo thing going on, I don't know. 
That was exactly 20 years ago this month that we did that. Now, I said luck has played a really big part in bringing me here. Here's another good example. People often ask me how I switched from the games industry to the film industry. And I wish I could tell you that it was some astounding act of bravery, that I gambled the wonderful career I already had in games for a chance to make it in Hollywood, and that the gamble paid off. But that's not how it happened. I grew up loving games, and I grew up loving movies, and I would have been thrilled for either of them to turn into an actual career. And I already had the games career. The idea of going for both just seemed, I don't know, kind of greedy. I'm quite certain that I never would have had the courage to voluntarily risk the very nice career that I had to go pursue some million to one Hollywood dream. But around 2000, 2001, PC Gamers publisher shit the bed in the dot-com crash, lost a ton of money, and had to lay a lot of people off, including me. So I got kicked off the very comfortable train I'd been on for years. And I had to decide if I wanted to get back on the same train or try something else. I could have got another job in games. I had a pretty good resume. But I also had about a year's worth of savings if I lived on you know, ramen noodles for a year. And by now, I was living in California, and Hollywood didn't seem so far away anymore. So I started bashing out lots of screenplays, each one slightly less awful than the last. Until finally, I had one that I thought I wouldn't be embarrassed to show people. And I sent that one out to various talent managers in Hollywood. It was called Oliver. And it was a post-apocalyptic retelling of Oliver Twist, with Oliver reimagined as a genetically engineered superhero. <laughs> I know, right? And then one Sunday afternoon, I got a call from a guy called Lawrence Mattis, who's one of the top talent managers in Hollywood. He reps the Wachowskis, he reps Robert Kirkman, all kinds of big people. And he said, I'm only halfway through your script, but I already know I want to sign you. He really liked my writing. Here's where the luck comes in. Lawrence didn't know why he had my script. It was in his pile of scripts to take home and read over the weekend, but it didn't have any coverage. Basically, before someone like Lawrence reads a script, it goes through a whole phalanx of professional script readers whose job it is to sort out the good ones from the bad ones, and they write a little summary of the ones they like, and that's called coverage. But my script didn't have that. It was just in his read pile by itself. And it turned out someone had literally put my script in the wrong pile by mistake. <laughs> no one had read it. It just went straight to Lawrence. And so it's entirely possible that had someone read it, they might not have liked it. They might have rejected it. And Lawrence never sees it. And again, I'm probably not standing here today. So that's how I got my foot in the door in Hollywood. Oliver, by the, Oliver, by the way, never became a movie. But this year, I took that old script and I adapted it into a comic book with my friend Derek Robertson. And you can get that in comic stores right now. So a few, few years, I kind of batted around the minor leagues in Hollywood. I sold my first script called Reaper. Here's the poster the production company made right after they bought the script. See the part that says, coming 2005? Yeah. <laughs> I keep that poster on my wall to remind me how long things can take in Hollywood. They are actually still trying to make it. <laughs> so I did a lot of uncredited rewriting work on very forgettable movies, things like this. <laughs> who's, actually, who's, who's even seen that fucking movie? All right, some of you, I guess, okay. I have a lot of really fun Jason Statham stories, though. Very nice man. But I still hadn't had anything made. And for a screenwriter, that sucks. You can make a living as a screen. Many people do make a living as a screenwriter, and they never have anything produced. And for a while, that's what I did. But that's no fun, particularly at parties. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a screenwriter. Oh, have you had anything produced? No. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you're just a wannabe screenwriter then. I got so tired of having that conversation, I started to be a bit of a dick about it. People would ask me, oh, have you written any movies I might have seen? And I would say, I don't know, what movies have you seen? <laughs> then I just stopped going to parties altogether. <laughs> okay, so time for another spectacular piece of luck. Around this time, a good friend of mine, who's a game developer, his name's Mike Micah, invited me to his company's Halloween party. They had a Halloween party every year, and it was a different theme every year. And this year, it had a post-apocalyptic theme. So my wife and I started figuring out our costumes, what, who we wanted to go as. And I didn't want to just be like Mad Max or whatever. I wanted to do something original. So I had this idea for a crazy preacher character with a Bible in one hand and a machete in the other, bringing the word of the Lord to the mutants and the godless heathens in the wasteland. Here I am. <laughs> and I started to think about who this character was, and I got really into it. And I started to build a whole character and a story and a world around it. 
And I grew up loving westerns, and I grew up loving samurai movies. And this seemed like a great way to play with all that stuff. I really wanted to write this idea. I wanted to write a script. But I knew it was kind of nuts, this guy carrying a Bible and chopping people's heads off. And I knew that if I pitched it to my agent, they would talk me out of writing it. Write something else. We'll never be able to sell that. So I didn't tell them. I just went off and wrote it myself in a kind of a fever dream, writing 16 to 18 hours a day. And six days later, I had the first draft of the Book of Eli. I think Denzel pulls the outfit off far better than I did. I have a lot of fun stories about how that movie got made, mostly to do with what an awesome guy Denzel is. He's just the best. Here we are on set. One quick story. OK, so spo the movie's been out 10 years, so it's not my problem. Spoilers. Eli's blind. But you don't find that out until the end of the movie. Now, in the scripts, the way I did that was he wears sunglasses the whole film. And at the end, he takes them off, and you realize he's obviously clearly blind. Like he has white like, kind of eyes. But Denzel didn't want to do it that. He said, I, I, I'm not wearing sunglasses through the whole fucking movie. People want to see my face. We're going to have to solve this. I said, well, how are we going to solve it? And he said, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to act it. I'm going to, just going to play it in such a way that you don't realize I'm blind until the reveal. And then when you go back, you'll realize I was blind all along. And then he said, the dumbest thing I've ever said in my life. I said to Denzel Washington, are you sure you can pull that off acting-wise? <laughs> To his face. <laughs> and he didn't say anything, he just gave me this look like, bitch, please. <laughs> and it didn't come up for the rest of the day. But as he was walking me out to his front door, he stopped and he grabbed something off of his shelf and he said, Oh, by the way, Gary, here. And I was holding his two Oscars. for training day and for glory. And again, he didn't, didn't need to say anything. It was just his way of saying, that's the last time if you, are, you ask me if I can fucking act. <laughs> but he's just the best. One day I was on set, it was actually this day that this photograph was taken, he spotted me after a take, and he knew that this was my first movie to ever get made, and it was really special to me. And he came over and he grabbed me by the shoulders and says, Gary, your words are coming alive, they're coming alive, how does it feel? I was like, fucking, this is ridiculous, I couldn't believe it was happening. But if I'm not invited to that Halloween party, none of this happens. I don't know if I'm standing here today. So enough people liked Eli that it really kick-started my movie career properly, and I started getting bigger jobs. I worked on Akira. I worked on the Warcraft movie. And another person who really likes the movie was Will Smith. Literally the day after the Eli premiere, I was at his house in Calabasas. It's an insane fucking house. I was really worried about being late for this meeting, so I left like way early. And as it turned out, it did take a long time to get there. And I arrived at the front gate of his property like at 8.59. The meeting was at 9 a.m. I thought, great, I'm on time. What I didn't realize was when you're at the front gate, you're still 10 minutes from the fucking house. <laughs> Security guard said, okay, you go down here. You're going to come to a massive house on the right. Keep going, that's the guest house. <laughs> and eventually, you'll trust me, you'll know it. It's on this house on a lake, this massive lake. The property is called Her Lake. Literally, as I was arriving, the guy from Architectural Digest was leaving. It's that kind of a house. And Will had this idea for a sci-fi movie that he wanted to do together with his son, Jaden. And I pitched him some ideas, and I got the job. And the next year of my life was fucking insane, because basically I got to be Turtle on Entourage. <laughs> Hanging out with one of the biggest movie stars in the world, working on story. And Will is exactly who you think he is. He's just the nicest guy on the planet. We cracked each other up constantly. He's just the best. I don't remember the context, but he made some joke about me pissing on his face that was like the funniest I've ever laughed in my life. <laughs> There's my man, Will. And I had a great time working with him. And I had really, really high hopes for the movie. It was very exciting. I had my name on a billboard in Times Square. We had the biggest movie star in the world, a big name, award-winning director. What could go wrong? Yeah, people did not like the movie. And while the truth is most of my script got rewritten, which is pretty common in Hollywood, it still hit me like a punch in the gut. This was by far the biggest and most public failure I'd ever experienced. The reviews were terrible. It was a total bomb. <laughs> it was so bad 
Some friends of ours left a box of donuts on our front doorstep on opening weekend to cheer me up. And they were pretty good donuts, but they tasted like pity. And for a while, I was really quite depressed and honestly quite worried. I had a one-year-old daughter and a family to support. I honestly didn't know if I would come back from having my name on such a high-profile failure. So I started writing a novel, trying to open up another avenue in case I never worked in film again. Now, the previous year, I'd had some success working as a writer and a story consultant for Telltale's The Walking Dead. People really did like that. We won a lot of awards. That's where the BAFTAs in the previous photograph came from. And I thought, okay, maybe I'll be a writer for video games. And in fact, since then, I've done a lot of that kind of work. I still do. And I really enjoy it because it combines two things that I love, games and storytelling. But back then, I honestly thought I might never write another movie. And for a while, yeah, the phone didn't ring. Until one day, it did. I can still remember where I was when I heard Disney had bought Lucasfilm and the Star Wars movies were coming back. I was standing in line at a Popeye's fried chicken. <laughs> and I went right from Twitter where I'd seen the news, swiped over to my phone app and called my agent while I was still standing in line for my chicken. And I said, you've got to throw my hat in the ring on this fucking Star Wars thing. And he said, yeah, yeah, you and everybody else. Because of course, every writer in Hollywood is making that same call at that same moment. But they threw my hat in the ring, and as the wild passed, and they just forgot all about it. Why? I mean, why? Seriously, why would they want me? There's literally hundreds of writers more qualified and with better credits than me. But they did call me, and I went to a meeting at Lucasfilm, not knowing anything about why they wanted to talk to me. And I left, not knowing anything about why they wanted to talk to me. <laughs> One thing I learned about working at Lucasfilm is it's like working at the CIA. They're very, very secretive. And they just asked me to talk about my love of Star Wars. And I told them about how I cried at the end of Return of the Jedi when I was 11, how I froze my Han Solo action figure in the ice cube tray <laughs> to freeze him in carbonite, and then I would thaw him out under the warm tap. And I assumed they might be there for like a comic or a video game or something, which I would have been thrilled to do. But a few days after that, they sent me a document called Destroyer of Worlds. And it was a one-page story idea about the rebels who stole the Death Star plans for a feature film. And I seriously called them and said, I think you've sent me the wrong document. And they said, no, no, Rebels, Death Star plans, what do you think? I said, are you fucking kidding me? I'm in, I'm in, all the way in. But I didn't have the job yet. I had to go back and pitch my ideas to a guy called John Knoll, who's the guy who had the original idea to tell this story of the Rebels who stole the Death Star plans. And if you don't know who John Knoll is, you should, he's an absolute legend. He's worked on the Star Wars films for decades. He's the chief creative officer of Industrial Light and Magic. Oh, and he invented Photoshop. That's true. So I was super nervous. I had to pitch him my ideas, which was basically to do an old-fashioned World War II men on a mission movie, like, you know, Guns and Averon, or We're Eagles Dare, but set in the Star Wars universe. Maybe a little kind of Zero Dark Thirty as well, for a kind of contemporary feel. And much later, after I got the job, they actually showed me John's original pitch document that he used to pitch the movie idea in the first place to Kathy Kennedy. And it was full of references to old World War II movies and Zero Dark Thirty. So I just happened to say the right thing. But again, back then, I still didn't have the job yet. I had to meet with Gareth Edwards, the director, and with Kathy Kennedy, and with Alan Horn, who runs Disney. And by some miracle, I didn't fuck it up, and they let me go write a Star Wars movie. Just to clarify, I'm actually one of four credited writers on the film, all of whom made major, major contributions to that film. Very much a team effort. But I wound up getting to do ridiculous things like this. That's me with John on Yavin 4. And honestly, when I first walked onto that Rebel base set, I almost cried. Because they had recreated it so perfectly from the original movie. It was like going back in time and stepping right into the original Star Wars. And I got to do this. Okay, I've got to tell you the story behind this. For months when I was working with Gareth on the, on the story, I hectored him constantly. When we shoot, you've got to put me in the background somewhere. I've got to be in the movie, even if it's like a face in the background. He said, yeah, yeah, totally. And when the time came, when we were on Yavin, it's actually a place called Cardington Sheds in England. Um, 
Gareth was there, and he said, okay, go over to the costume area and just tell them what you want to do, and they'll hook you up. Went over to costumes, and they had everything, all the rebel stuff, the, the pilots, the rebel commandos, the rebel officers, everything. And the costume guy said, who, like, what do you want to do? Who do you want to be? I said, well, I mean, if I can pick, Jesus, I want to be a fucking X-Wing pilot. And so they could see that I was a bigger guy. And so they pulled out all the flight suits that they had, and they gave me the biggest one they had, and it just barely fit me. And I was like, this is going to be fine. I'll be OK. And they were like, no, 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 we, this is not going to work. And I remember thinking, fuck, if I don't get to be an X-Wing pilot because I'm too fat, I'm going to have a fucking complex for the rest of my life. <laughs> But one of the costume guys said, oh, no, wait, I think we actually might have something that will work. And I said, what? And they said, do you know who Porkins is? <laughs> I was like, yeah, the fat one. <laughs> and they said, well, we have his flight suit here. And it's not being used. Maybe that'll work. And it fit me like a glove. That's the Porkins flight suit. And if you know Star Wars really well, you already know that because you'll recognize the helmet. That's the Porkins insignia on the helmet from the original movie. Another thing that happened while I was on Yavin was I learned something really important about the power of Star Wars. I was hanging out with the other X-Wing pilots. There's a lot of standing around on movie sets. I know, I actually got to say that. I was hanging, hanging around with the other X-Wing pilots, all the extras. And they're all wearing these crazy 70s wigs and stuff because they, you know, they had to match the original movie. Um, and a lot of standing around on movie sets, waiting for the next setup, lights and everything. It takes ages. It's so, movie sets are actually really boring. Um, and I was talking to these other extras, asking them, like, what? Because people generally aren't extras full time. They have other, they have, you know, regular jobs. And I asked a couple of these guys, like, what do you, like, what do, you do when you're not being an extra? And they said, oh, we're, we're in the Royal Air Force. We're, we're, they, they actually flew uh, RAF tornado jets. And they had flown real combat missions in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what happens, what I learned was basically, if, you, if you're casting someone in a movie that, that is like a soldier or a pilot, or whatever, there are casting agencies that specialize in connecting you that, with people that are actually active or ex-military. Because they already know how to handle a weapon. They already know how to walk and carry themselves. They just have that kind of military bearing. And these guys, you could tell, like, they look like, oh, that's a pilot. You could just tell these guys look the part. And I said to this guy, well, this missing rather silly to you. I mean, you, you fly real pilot, uh, real fighter jets. And we're standing next to this, this full-size X-wing, but it's just fake. It's not real. The buttons and the pipes and the flight suits aren't real. It's all pretend. This must seem kind of silly to you. And I'll never forget this. The guy got very serious. He says, no, no, you don't get it. The whole reason why I'm a pilot is I saw Star Wars when I was a kid. And I wanted nothing more than to fly an X-wing. And so he said, for me, this is the real dream. Not, being, not actually becoming a tornado pilot, but being here today. This is it. I've made it. Those are the actual Death Star plans. <laughs> Which in a very metatextual moment, I did in fact try to steal. <laughs> but they wouldn't let me. Lucasfilm security, way better than Imperial security. <laughs> and working on Rogue One was a really great example of how ideas often come from the strangest places. Many of you may have heard the story about how the planet Scarif, which is where the Death Star plans are stolen, was inadvertently named by a Starbucks barista who misspelled Gareth's name on a coffee cup. <laughs> it's a true story. But then there's also weird stuff like this. I was doing the dishes one day while I was working on the script, and I looked at the sink stopper and I thought, "Hi, oh, that reminds me of something. It kind of looks like if you pulled out the Death Star laser array and separated it out. Next thing you know, <laughs> crazy, right? But the greatest thing about being a part of Star Wars, and I mean this sincerely, is the fans. Meeting them all at the premiere and seeing how excited they all were and hearing how much they liked the movie was absolutely the highlight. This guy really liked it. <laughs> Came up to me after the movie and gave me a big hug. He was like, dude, he was so happy. The whole premiere was nuts. You can see me there in the top right corner, standing next to Bob Iger, the chairman of Disney, the only person in that whole photo who's grinning like a kid who just won a fucking contest. <laughs> so
So working on Star Wars was probably the greatest privilege of my life. It's beyond anything I could have imagined when I was a kid playing Commodore 64 games and making up stories to go along with them. I could work for 50 more years in this business and I will never top this. My name up there in the blue letters. With the John Williams movie, a music playing behind it. And since then, I've continued to write for Star Wars, for TV, for books, and for comics. And it's just been this ongoing honor that I feel will, like will last for the rest of my life. Last year, I was inducted as an honorary member into the 501st and Rebel Legions alongside Mads Mikkelsen. And again, the best part of all of it is the fans. It's like instantly becoming friends with thousands of people all over the world at once. And they become your friends for life. And that kind of brings us up to date. So if there's an overriding theme to this talk, it's really just how galactically lucky I've been. There's a saying, it's better to be lucky than good. The truth is you need to be a little bit of both. Many, many talented people out there who will never get their break because they'll just never get that little bit of luck they also need. Conversely, you can get by purely on luck for a while, but ultimately, if you're not very good, you will find yourself running out of luck real fast. But luck isn't something that's totally out of your control. Some of it is just random chance, buying the Amiga instead of the Atari ST, getting laid off from a job, which actually opened up a whole other doorway, the script in the wrong pile. But to a great extent, I believe you make your own luck through persistence and hard work. And the persistence part is really important because any creative life, whether it's in games or movies or whatever, is absolutely rife with failure and rejection and self-doubt, no matter how successful you become. Early in my career, I was lucky enough to meet the great writer-director Frank Darabont. This is the only photograph I have of me and Frank together. You can see me over there on the far right next to the guy in the green hat. That's from the Walking Dead pilot. I called in a favor and got him to cast me as a walker. But years earlier, Frank had let me pick his brains about screenwriting, and I talked to him for hours. And I told him about how, as a young newbie writer, I was terrified every time I sat down and started to write the terror of the blank page and that blinking cursor. And he said, oh, yeah, tell me about it. And I was like, wait, what, you? You wrote the Shawshank Redemption. And he said, yeah, it doesn't matter. The feeling never goes away. Every time I sit down, I forget about whatever success I've had, and it's like I'm starting all over again. And that imposter syndrome that I talked about, the start just kicks in. And I remember thinking, shit, I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse. <laughs> like, it's nice to know that the top pros suffer the same way I do, but it's not so nice to know that no matter how successful I become, that feeling's never going to go away. But it's true. No matter how successful you become, that success will always be outweighed by failure. It will always be overshadowed by self-doubt. Only last year, I had a major crisis of confidence where I just felt like I couldn't write anymore. I just felt like I was spent. The well had completely run dry. I was in a real funk. And it was really hard to push through it. And for every fun story I've told you today about some success I've had, I have dozens of stories of failure. Believe me, I could depress the fuck out of you if I wanted to. <laughs> I often equate it to being like an iceberg. The tiny part of the iceberg that breaks the surface of the water and is visible is your success. But the vast majority that lurks underneath the surface is all the failure and the rejection that people never see. But the key to surviving that, and not just giving up, lies in understanding that failure is not the opposite of success, it's a part of it. Every failure, every rejection has something to teach you if you let it. Every failure, every rejection I've experienced has been part of a journey that might have worked out very differently otherwise, but which in fact deposits me here on this stage today in front of all of you, kicking off one of the greatest gatherings of gamers and geeks on the planet. A few quick things before I go. If you want more of this premium Witter content, <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Witter. You can also follow me on Twitch at Gary Witter. We have a lot of fun. On Twitch, I play obscure games, I do AMAs, I have a bubble machine. You should come and check it out. <laughs> and of course, you can catch me every Wednesday on Kind of Funny Games Daily, alongside the great Greg Miller. <laughs> a 
And since we're here at PAX, you might be interested to know that I've created my very own tabletop game. It's called Space Rocks. And it's something I devised out of frustration that board games these days have become too complicated, too many rules. These games now, they come in a box the size of a fucking shipping container and thousands of plastic pieces and, 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 and cards, and it takes six hours just to learn the rules before you can even start playing. Enough already. So Space Rocks is a very simple game. In fact, it has no rules at all. If you come see me in the Badland area on the sixth floor later on, you can buy a copy from me, and I'll explain to you exactly, absolutely why you should not play under any circumstances. <laughs> it's a very limited edition. We made fewer than 100, so come and get one from me while they last. We also have pins and stickers to give away. If you find me around the show, come talk to me. I'll give you a pin or a sticker. I also want to thank my wife, Leah, who has put up with me for almost 15 years. Here she is at PAX a few years ago, kicking ass at Left 4 Dead 2. Now, I'm not the easiest person to live with. I'm always walking around inside my own head, which means she has to repeat herself constantly. And when I do hear something, I tend to just immediately forget it. And I'm just often very moody and just generally a pain in the ass. And I fart. <laughs> and bad ones, too. I believe that the official category is silent but violent. It's just awful, awful. She puts up with all of it. And she met me when I was between careers, after the games journalism thing, but when I was still trying to get started as a screenwriter. So I was kind of nowhere. I had no real prospects. She went out with me anyway. And I've said a few times today, who knows where I'd be if this or that had or hadn't happened. One thing I know for sure is I would not be here without her. <laughs> Finally, I want to leave you with a story. It's a heartwarming story of personal triumph and about how through sheer persistence you can win in the end no matter how hopeless things may seem at times. Who knows what these are? It's my favorite candy. When I was about 12 years old, I went to the shops. My dad sent me to buy a newspaper. And at the shop, there was this old lady, and she was giving out free samples of, of toffee fay. Toffee fay had just, it had just been introduced to the UK. It was like a new thing, so they were doing all these promotions and giving out free samples. She must have been like this lady giving the samples out. She must have been like in her 70s. She was pretty old. And I thought, wow, well, great. If I, if I hang out, she'll give me a free sample. She was giving them to everyone. But she didn't. She totally and very deliberately ignored me. She kept offering other people samples as they, but literally everyone that came past, she gave a sample to. But not to me. And I'm standing right there. Now, I get it. Maybe I'm not the target market. Toffee Faye wasn't like buying a Kit Kat. They were being marketed as like a luxury candy, like an upmarket thing. And I imagine she thought, oh, this is not those kid. Like, why give him a free sample? It's not like he's going to buy a box of them. Okay, fair enough. But come on, play the game. Give, the kid a, give a kid a sweet. And so I remember thinking, okay, I get that you're not going to give me a Toffee Faye. You've made that abundantly clear. But if you're going to ignore me, I'm going to force you to do it for a really long time. And it turned into this battle of wills, this passive aggressive war of attrition. And this went on for more than an hour. <laughs> I was just standing there pretending to browse the magazines just in her general area. I was right in front of her, she kept ignoring me. And in the end, I, I guess she won because eventually I had to leave, I had to go home for dinner. And maybe it's petty, but it's bugged me for years. I kept thinking about it kept me awake at night. Why didn't she give me a toffee fay? But ever since that day, all my life since then, I've worked hard. I've applied myself. And today, 35 years after that day, I'm now a grown-up, I'm rich, and I can have as many toffee fays as I want. And she's dead. Thank you and have a great PAX.